Uh, my name is Peter Hessler. Uh, I am with the OpenBSD organization, and I also work for a company called Vantronic Secure Networks in Germany. And is this working? Okay, now it's working. Sorry about that. Um, and my talk today will be on uh, using routing tables and routing domains in, in networks. Um, so many of you are probably asking, you know, is this working? No. Okay. I push button and it no work. <laughs> I blame Henning. So the... Okay. So a lot of you are asking, what are these? So ordinarily you would have a single routing table inside the kernel and that chooses where packets will go. So what this does is we give you two additional mechanisms. Uh, so the first one is an R table, which is an alternative routing table, but still within the same overall, overall instance. Um, the key point is that the IP addresses and networks cannot overlap. Is that you ha they have to be unique within the entire system. Um, and you can have multiple routing tables within the same R domain. Which then brings us to what is an R domain? It's completely independent routing table instance. So for example, you can have the 10 slash 8 network a dozen times on your system. And this can talk to the individual networks that it's connected to without interfering with the other behavior. Um, in OpenBSD, uh, these are, the interface itself is assigned to a routing domain. And that's what determines uh, where the packets leave the system. It also determines which routing table it's assigned to when packets come in. Um, and R domains always contain at least one R table. Um, they can create more, but this is a not very common use case. Uh, big caveat for now, IPv4 only. Yes, thank you, Henning. Um, I am working on uh, bringing IPv6 support to this. Uh, right now I can pass packets for about four seconds and then they get lost somewhere. Um, so we're 90% of the way there, we just have the remaining 90% of the code to write. So uh, this using R tables and R domains, there's two very common terminology that'll be used, uh, popularized mostly by Cisco, um, VRF light and then full VRF. So VRF light is multiple routing tables, multiple routing domains. It's done by hand. It's all centralized within one or two machines. Uh, it's common in your smaller single location, small number of location systems. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the big example or the big advantage is that you only need a single system to uh, to use it. You don't need to connect to anybody else. You don't have to explain to them what your network configuration is. Um, probably some good examples are like small to medium sized ISPs with a number of customers connecting to it. You give the customers individual <laughs> routing domains, that way they cannot get access to the other uh, routing domains uh, for alternative customers. And then you have a full VRF. This is fairly commonly known as MPLS. Um, basically this is for large enterprises with many multiple sites connecting up uh, all together, uh, uses BGP, uh, LDP, uh, which I will explain in a few minutes. And so a good example of VRF and MPLS would be like, for example, um, like Deutsche Telekom. They have hundreds and thousands of locations all over the world and they want to have a single network within, within their organization, but they don't want to advertise this network over the wide internet. So, um, when you are doing this, there are a number of things that you need to be aware of. The most important one is default route all of the things. Always default route. Because 
when we, take, when we receive an incoming packet, we will check if we have a route to the destination. And this happens before you have any chance to steal the packet or to move the packet or to uh, decide where it's going to go. It's something we should look into, but this is how it is today. This is how it's been for quite some time. So this is an extremely common mistake um, at the company I work for, Ventronics. Probably 40% of our support calls for there's a problem with my new R domain is this problem. It's a very common mistake. It's very easy to, to overlook. Um, which means debugging can be painful sometimes because which route, which R domain is it using? It's not using the normal uh, interfaces. It's using a slightly different area, um, which is also means, so which route will it use? Uh, ordinarily, traffic within a uh, routing domain will stay within that routing domain unless you steal it, possibly with PF. Um, PF is able to make decisions on, on which uh, routing domain a packet came in on and should go to. Uh, so a very common uh, configuration of VRF flight is, or so, so normally VRF flight is the more common case that I've seen. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, this is very common in like a shared infrastructure for an ISP. You have, let's say, 20 customers all connecting to your network and they need access to the, the raw internet and your shared management systems, but they also need to be completely separated from the other customers. Everybody uses 10 slash 8, everybody uses 192, 168, and everybody uses the, all the other internal private networks. And so in before our domains, you would have to have completely separate routers and then NAT all the boxes independently to get to your main network. That's a lot of boxes, it's a lot of power, it's a lot of cooling, and it's going to cost you a lot of money to actually buy all this stuff. So instead, you can synchronize them all to a single machine and have this route for your network. Um, very commonly, you'll have things like a shared backup system that'll connect to the customer's location, monitoring of all the customer's location, and that'll need to have access to all of the different R domains in, in their system. Or in, uh, they'll need to have access to all of the customer uh, systems, so it'll use the R domains to jump over and get access to those. And then you have full VRF. This is, uh, again, is primarily MPLS. You use uh, LDP, which is the lab label distribution protocol. And this is a way of telling the other, uh, the other uh, MPLS routers on your network who you are and where and how they should uh, propagate your routes to them. Um, and then over this, you use BGP to do the translation, to also advertise your internal routes over this external route protocol. Uh, it basically builds up um, some, essentially what's called just, v, they're just VPN tunnels, but with no encryption at all. So they can be really fast and done in hardware on the bigger, more expensive, uh, like Cisco routers and things that have no CPU but a lot of dedicated hardware that will uh, process your networks. Um, sadly, I don't have a lot of experience in running the full VRF. Uh, the vast majority of our customers are doing just simple VRF light with R domains on their machines themselves. So after we got this written, uh, we started to implement this and actually deploy this. Now, as I'm sure you all know, testing a system and designing something kind of new is one thing, but actually running it and having real traffic go over it is completely another thing. Um, so the first bit is um, a way to execute commands within a dedicated R domain. So for example, uh, for route, we added uh, the exec command. So normally when you run a system, everything is in R domain zero. Uh, but if you need to run, for example, ping or a server or anything else, you need to jump over to the other one. 
we originally developed the route exec for testing, just so that way we did not have to uh, you know, add supports to everything individually. Turns out it's very, very useful. It's a great thing, great thing to use, that way we don't have to add support to everything. Um, and this is now the recommended way to start multiple services and multiple daemons in different R domains. So if you want to have uh, a web server in, say, R domain 20, you would just you know, write exec t20 and then Apache. But of course, there's a few necessary network tools and a few daemons where this doesn't quite work out, which I will describe in just a bit. Uh, the next part is when you add an IP address, or when you add an R domain to an interface, then uh, the question is, what should we do if there's any IP address already configured on it? Should we keep it? Should we delete it? Uh, turns out the best solution is to just simply erase the configuration on, on that interface. So you, uh, so you need to re-add the uh, IP address and, and netmask and all that uh, configurations af after you assign the R domain. Um, you can have dedicated tagged VLANs uh, in a different R domain than the parent interface. It's completely legal. It's just encapsulated packets. Not a problem. Uh, CARP for failing over does need to be in the same R domain as its parent because incoming packets come on CARP, outgoing go on the parent. Having them in different will create a lot of problems. <laughs> Uh, we ran into some problems with FTP proxy. So when going through NAT, you need a helper because FTP is just an incredibly retarded protocol. The problem is, is that when we, is sometimes you don't want to just change it from any protocol to R domain zero or from R domain zero to any. You need to do both. Which is why this, the source and destinations uh, R domains matter. You need to be able to make decisions and to uh, assign them for this. Now, as I mentioned, when with, uh, with route exec, you want to run some daemons multiple times. This gets extremely entertaining when you try and run NTPD. So you want to, you want to ser start serving time to more systems. Well, that's always a very good thing. Everything should be in sync. Um, so for everything else, you start it again. But with NTP, it uh, tries to synchronize your clock as well. So you start two or five NT NTP daemons, and they're all syncing the clock, and they all think they're the master. So after about 30 minutes of real time, my laptop is now five hours ahead. And after leaving it overnight, it's now next year. <laughs> so you definitely don't want to do that. Um, Obviously we do, yes, because customers can be in different locations and we need to be careful with this. Um, so NTPD is one of these daemons that actually does run, uh, that actually does have internal knowledge of how R domains work. So that way you can say, I have my server in one set of R domains, like in the management network, I am providing, uh, I am providing time for people in these other R domains as well. And then, uh, another thing we needed to add was not just identify a packet and then send it to a different R domain or our table, we need to be able to make filtering decisions in the firewall based on the incoming uh, R domain. Because with R domain, since you can have multiple IP addresses, again, the 10 slash 8 network is no longer just the one network you've always been used to. So then you need to be able to specify where it came in on. So when designing your, uh, when you're designing your, your network, uh, make sure you always add a default route. Again, it doesn't have to point to a real place. If you're, going to be, if you're only gonna be stealing the packets with PF and putting them into another one, but you definitely have to have this. Normally you won't see this because you always have a default route. 
for, to your ISP, or if you're running BGP, then you get all of the routes from the internet anyways. So it's so common, I need to emphasize this <laughs> many times. Um, there are some neat tricks that you can do with PF, uh, which I will explain in a few minutes. Uh, just be aware of what you can and cannot do. Um, and it's very helpful to spend as much time as you can in the planning stage because it is complicated. Uh, you will have to think about which R domain is traffic coming in on, where do I want to route it, how do I want to firewall these things off, and since a lot of people are just simply not used to having multiple routing tables, it takes a few extra, it takes a few extra minutes to just work yourself through all, the, all these problems. So definitely plan it correctly. Um, so here is a very, very sam uh, simple setup. Um, I assigned my interface to R domain one, uh, and then I assigned of course, the 10 network, because this is what everybody uses. And then I added default. Um, personally, I, as soon as I assign the first address, I assign a, I assign a route. Uh, so that way I, I don't forget later. And then you can do nifty, uh, nifty tricks in PF. So this I will uh, explain a bit more in detail. Um, so we can do, we have anchors, which allow you to have a set of rules that only apply if the first line matches, basically an and statement. So for example, for the customer, uh, all of their traffic on R domain 15, you allow, you block all the traffic by default, allow ICMP traffic, so pings and trace out work, and then you uh, allow access to just HTTP. Uh, of course, when you're doing, um, you, you should do more specific, depending on which direction things are going, uh, so that way you don't have any, any stealth web servers. It's just merely show you what, that you can add all sorts of uh, rules into here. Uh, this next rule, pass in on R domain two, R table four, will, for any incoming traffic, that is received on R domain two, it'll be sent out the system in, R in the R table number four. Uh, this rule does not do NAT, so in that case you would, you probably should have uh, separate IP addresses, uh, otherwise things will get, get confused, but this is how you can just steal traffic and send it over. Uh, and then the final rule is a NAT, so you pass out, from this network, and then you can simply assign it to the outbound table. Um, this is actually a, this is a rule that one of our customer uses. Um, that, that's how they get access for a lot of, a lot of things out to the internet. Uh, you can have your, your default route going over uh, non R table zero. It's perfectly fine. Uh, they're basically uh, full-featured running tables. Um, <coughs> so that's pretty much the end of my talk. Uh, I want to give special thanks to Henning for actually doing a lot of the low-level lifting work. Please mention why you did it, because I don't quite remember the story. And this is where And after Claudio's the basic argument, Peter is playing his role now. He's really the one who, who polished this to the point where it's usable and remote. Yeah, so, so part of what I do 
at Ventronix is I write a little bit of code, but I mostly do the customer support. And so I'm able to remember the questions that my customers are asking and, and the type of networks they're trying to design. And so um, I actually have to deal with this stuff. And so thankfully, I'm able, I'm, I'm able to help polish it up, get it working better, discover all of these evil, evil things. Um, and yeah, so, so Claudio actually took a look at, at what Cisco, how, at all the Cisco documents about this, describing how they're implementing it, decided this is actually is a good idea and that we should implement it as well, you know, relatively similarly. Um, he also had to put up with all my just crazy questions in the beginning, uh, especially the, the default route case. That screwed me over a couple times in the very, very beginning. Again, your was not to our brains initially, right? Right, so yeah. No, of, of course, yeah. So, in, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have multiple routing tables, but they all exist within the same routing domain. Yes. And that you can always move up in the, in the tables, but you cannot move to another domain unless you explicitly declare it in PF or you do a loopback connection back into the system. Mm -hmm. There are cases where I have wanted to do this, where that would have solved several problems. No yes. So, uh, any questions? Is there any overhead uh, regarding the uh, use uh, at the lookups uh, in during uh, parsing of the in the loop? Is there any benchmark regarding uh, overhead? Um, there is not a public benchmark, uh, but at Ventronics we have benchmarked it and we found basically zero difference in, in performance with this. Um, the only hit is a bit more memory is used in the kernel to store an additional routing table. Uh, however, um, the routing tables are only, or the, the additional routing tables and additional routing domains are only created on demand. So in the normal use case of I just want, you know, my single default route, you're not wasting anything extra. Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, do we need dedicated physical, physical interfaces or can we virtualize this? The answer is, is in OpenBSD, VLANs are real interfaces. And so you can have as many uh, VLANs on top of the same physical interface as you would like, um, up to the, the RFC maximum of, I think, 4,096. And uh, each VLAN can be a different our domain, if you would like. I believe we have a hard code limit of 256 or 1024 our domains because it's an array? 256, yeah. It's 256, okay. Um, so that's the limit uh, of our domains in the defaults. Uh, you can just, it's one defined if you want to change this. Uh, but you would have, of course, have to re recompile your kernel. Um, the but if you are using physical interfaces, you would have to have one R domain per interface. You cannot mix them unless you have a, a, uh, a child, I guess, like a VLAN interface. Uh, that code has not been committed. Yes. 
Uh, you, you you probably can play evil evil games with the ether and and bridge and other of our uh, pseudo interfaces. Yes, we we can do stacked VLANs. <laughs> uh, but, but yes, the an the answer is uh, one physical interface, a hundred VLANs, a hundred different R domains, completely legit. Uh, which is how uh, most of our customers are running it, uh, over 10 gig, 10 gig to the switch, and then just as many VLANs as they can throw on it. So, any other questions? That's something for the future. Uh, I personally have not looked at it. Um, we do support um, larger than uh, 1,500 um, frame size on many uh, Ethernet cards, as long as, they, as long as the card itself supports and the driver supports jumbos. Um, you, of course, can configure this manually, uh, but I, we don't have an automatic method of changing the MTU size for this. Yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the question is how do you manage the ARP table? And ARP is independent for each, each R domain. And that's my problem right now with the V6 code is the neighbor discovery protocol, essentially the IPv6 version of, of ARP. That has a few bugs still left in it that I, that I need to fix. Uh, but I believe once that's fixed, soon, <laughs> then that can be uh, committed. The, the answer is actually very easy because the ARP is in the wrong place. Uh, anything else? How many other uh, domains you are using at the moment? Um, at our largest customer, we have uh, 40 R domains. Um, the design of their network is not as optimal as it could be. They only really need to use three. The <laughs> yeah, uh, but they insisted on using this feature. And so actually, thank thanks to them, uh, that's how we discovered a lot of these issues and things that, that needed more polish on it. You mentioned 10 gig to the switch. Yes. Uh, the fastest we can get is 9 gigabit. 9 gigabit with uh, the 1500 frame size. And uh, th that is without PF, that's pure routing. I believe with PF we can get 7.5 or 8 gigabit. On what hardware? Uh, on IX, which is the Intel 10 gigabit card. And this is on, uh, I don't remember all the details, but reasonably new, super fast Xeon processors. Uh, it's the HP DL360 generation latest. <laughs> Uh, so the question is, does this use multiple threads? Uh, so it's, it's uh, is it M MP in the kernel? And the answer is in OpenBSD, no. Not yet. Uh, not yet. Um, we can do uh, MP in user land, but right now the kernel is still has the big log and still on single CPU. Couple of are There's a couple syscalls, but n no, 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 nothing in the, but nothing within the uh, routing area. 
So yeah, unfortunately now we are still limited to a single CPU. Uh, there is work being done on this. Of course, we have very high interest in this. Uh, the newer network cards allow you to assign uh, interrupt queues to independent CPUs. So that way you can actually get quite a bit of, of performance out of them. Okay, so the question is, is it, so just so I understand correctly, the question is how many interfaces can be a part of an R, a, a writing domain? And the answer is as many as you want. Uh, you're allowed to have, um, so of course in OBSD, the default routing domain is, R, is routing domain zero, and so all the interfaces show up there. You can assign as many interfaces as you want to any arbitrary R domain. Um, there is not, an, so, so the question is can you have the same writing table just copied multiple times? And the answer is you would have to create it manually. Um, there is not an automatic way to simply copy it over because that's an extremely rare case. Um, in the vast majority of cases I've seen, it's, it's been uh, completely different networks even within the individual writing, do, writing uh, domains. So the most common case is you have to do it yourself. Uh, anything else? Okay, so uh, thank you very much.